Hello, Alicia. Hi, everyone. Hi, happy Facebook Thursday. I'm excited about today's topic. Um, I'm so glad to be here, as always. I look forward to uh, preparing for our Facebook Live. Um, every time I pick a topic, I get really excited and also overwhelmed by the, the amount of information that I'd like to share with you. And today we have one topic that has been plaguing dogs around the world. And I know that many of you are worried and that's allergies. And it seems that allergies are the default diagnosis for everything that uh, goes on with dogs. And um, today I'd like to actually shed some light on how to recognize true allergies and what is not allergies. And uh, also give you an opportunity to ask some questions. And just to give you a heads up, we just, Alicia and I just uh, decided that two weeks from now, we'll have a question and answer uh, live cases um, webinar for uh, four dogs or allergic dogs. So that's gonna be on uh, Thursday, two weeks from now. Anyhow, where do I start? Um, allergies are a big problem. And I think not only a big problem for your dogs and also you, but also for the veterinary community. Because I remember um, just about six years ago, there was a big conference in Vancouver, dermatology conference that maybe had few thousand people, few, few thousand veterinarians um, attending. And allergies were the big topic. And it seemed that everyone was trying to solve them. And when I attended, and I did attend because it was in my hometown, I was really blown away that some of the most important parts of understanding allergies were missing from all the lectures and recommendations and, and you know, and, and uh, it, it just wasn't complete. So since then, I decided to humbly embark on the journey of trying to spread the, the information and, and what I've learned over the course of 30 years. And uh, similar to all the other conditions that I usually speak about at Facebook Lives, we will be applying a process which is called the healing cycle. And before I started um, broadcasting today, I was telling Alicia, you know, it's just repeating of the same thing, the same principles of healing in different formats. And for you, it's super important to understand the, 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 the whole um, core of the disease or the premise of, let's say, allergies or hypothyroidism or how these conditions actually happen and what they are for you to be able to apply the healing cycle. So today we're going to kind of experience another practical way of applying the healing cycle to allergic dogs. I will be sharing slides and then I'll be stopping the share and we'll have a little conversation. And I also would like to thank either Christina or Judy uh, who is uh, behind the scenes and she will, or they will, um, post uh, links and uh, information on our Facebook uh, comment section. So just to, just to let you know. There are virtually millions of dogs suffering of allergies. And, and it's really serious because, you know, when you think of allergies and, and itching and scratching and discomfort and skin infections and, and the level of distress that these bring to your dogs, but also to you, it's a really serious problem. And as I said, like it's, it's, it's probably the most commonly discussed problem in veterinary medicine. It may surprise you, and I talked about it before, that only a small portion of this whole group of dogs that are diagnosed as allergic are actually allergy, allergic. The rest of them are not allergic. And this is something that some of you may be surprised about, but that's just how it is. This is what I discovered. And I discovered it by not really having good results with the treatment uh, when I applied allergy treatment protocols early on in my, in my veterinary work. I'll give you some examples of misdiagnosed allergies. Um, 
you can see that this dog has um, missing hair around the eyes and probably has been rubbing his eyes as well. This dog has big patches of missing hair and hot spots. Uh, poor little soul. Uh, again, missing hair and fur and uh, paw licking and, and, and wrist licking in dogs is very, very common, commonly diagnosed as allergies. And when you're seeing these, these pictures, I know that, that you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, like, what can we do? And, 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 and most of the time, before these dogs are messed up with steroids and drugs and uh, wrong treatments, most of the time, these conditions can be addressed and helped really easily. And this is what we are going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about allergies, as I said, and also the conditions that are not allergies. I have learned about allergies the hard way. This is me, believe it or not, with hair uh, many years back. I'm just going to say maybe 39 years back. <laughs> um, and this is one of my horses that I fell in love. Uh, I used to ride horses and uh, part of riding horses was a lot of hard work. We used to collect hay and uh, bales of straw for the winter and uh, for me, it was absolute torture because I had severe hay fever. And my condition was so severe that I would not be able to breathe through the nose for about six months out of the year. So I've got to ask you just to plug your nose like this and see what it feels like and try to be like that. <laughs> Put a, plug, a nose plug on your, on your nose for six months. It's kind of crazy. It totally disables you. And... My allergies were actually true allergies. Uh, they were an allergic reaction that uh, the body developed as a result of um, genetic predisposition, but also poor diet and maybe some stress and all that. So I'm gonna go back to the slides and share screen one more time. So you can see me with hair, just kidding. <laughs> Just yesterday we were talking with someone and uh, and I was saying, you know, I actually think that not having hair is quite convenient because we don't need to really do our hair before the broadcast and all that stuff. Right, Alicia? <laughs> anyway. Spot on. I agree. We had an interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so most people say, well, you know, I've been dealt with a poor genetic card uh, and, and I can't do anything about it than just basically treat allergies. But, you know, DNA influence is, is only about 20% in the, the development of allergies. And the rest is internal and external conditions. And, and this doesn't apply only to allergies. It applies to other conditions, even to cancer. If you have cancer family in the history, the, D, the DNA can be actually either dormant for the rest of your life, or it can be triggered if we, if the internal conditions inside of the body, let's say as a result of nutrition or some stress or whatever else um, may in, in, uh, affect the, the internal conditions or the external conditions, which means, um, you know, environment, um, toxins, uh, chemicals, uh, bad air, pollution, and all that. So remember the DNA influence is actually not a huge portion of whether allergies actually happen or not. And this is actually really good news because even if our dogs are have a tendency to allergies, by managing their internal and external conditions, so-called epigenetic conditions, we can actually make them either have allergies or not. So um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about biology of allergies and I'll be using slides a little more than normally uh, because um, I'd like you to have some visuals. Um, most of you have heard of allergens, whether it's pollen or whether it's nuts, peanuts, um, some sort of grass. Um, allergens are the antigens. So in immunology, uh, there are basically two big players. One of them is the antigen, which is the allergen. And it always has to be protein actually of some sort. And then the antibody that is usually created by the body's body against the allergen. Okay. And then what happens, the antibody and the antigen bind together. They kind of lock onto each other 
because they the antibodies recognize the antigen and they try to block it and then it creates a whole cascade reaction in mast cells and mast cells are the 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 the, the cells in the body the blood cells that actually uh, release histamine so the, it's cascade reaction the body creates antibodies the antibodies lock onto the antigen and then that um informs the mast cells and the histamine release causes what we know as allergies, basically sw swollen skin, itchy skin. Uh, and most of the time, these allergic reactions are quite sudden, but sometimes can, they can be chronic. But, but the, the allergic reaction cannot happen the first time uh, around when the antigen enters or allergen enters the body. It has to, there has to be sort, sort of a time in between creating the antibodies and the allergic reaction to happen. Okay, so, you know, some people tell me, well, but I wasn't allergic for 20 years for peanuts and now I'm allergic. Well, the problem is that it reached a point, the tipping point when the body cannot deal with the burden and the immune system is basically ill. So see this allergic reaction actually as a reaction to something that is common, that the body should not be reacting to. And the allergies are not the, not the disease. They're just a symptom of what is happening with the immune system. So if you reprogram your mind and your brain, and from now on think of allergies as something that happens with the immune system, and that the aller allergies are just a symptom, they're not the disease. You know, people, people say, I have allergies, almost as if they were saying, I have a disease of allergies, and that is not correct. We have a disease of the immune system that is overreacting to the normal, generally occurring substance that we should not be reacting to. There's a difference between a virus that the body should react to and a pollen or uh, some sort of food, right? So, so there is a huge difference in that, um, in, in, in that, uh, from that point of view. Um, as I said, most allergies happen as a fast onset. You know, like I, if I would get to the stables, um, it would happen super fast. Or if I was stung by a bee, and I, I, I am allergic to bee stings to a point, uh, the swelling would happen really, really fast. And when I was a kid, I actually almost lost a finger. I was helping my grandpa picking some herbs. And it was actually mullein, these beautiful yellow flowers. And I grabbed the, the petal and there was a bee inside and I got stung. And pretty much within very short time, I got really swollen. But the next day I had big purple blisters on my hand. And I remember my grand, uh, grandpa took me to a doctor and they actually put me on steroids, believe it or not. And I almost lost my, lost my finger then. Uh, I think that they blocked the, 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 the normal healing response. And they were, I remember, I was a little kid, but I remember them talking about amputation and I was horrified. Well, I was lucky. I didn't, didn't lose my hand or my finger, but maybe that made me more passionate about um, allergies. Now, what happens with allergies, and let's talk a little bit about, we won't be talking as much about food allergies, but we will a little bit because the principles are the same. Let's talk about some of the allergies to, let's say, some uh, trees and grass and pollen and, and fungus and, and molds and all that. What is recommended in conventional medicine is to do allergy testing and see uh, what the reaction of the body is. So you can see here, uh, there's a little, <laughs> there's a little uh, allergy test. Uh, it looks like a tattoo, but it's not a tattoo. And basically, you inject a um, small amount of allergen in those little little uh, areas, and then you observe the reaction. You can see that um, <laughs> third row, third from the right, is actually a pretty big allergic reaction. Uh, first row, second uh, from the left, is no allergic allergic reaction, and so on. However, this doesn't really solve the problem, okay? So our immune system is reactive or our dog's immune system is reactive. Like we can see that here. Um, and in conventional medicine, what would usually happen, they would create this custom made um, injection or desensitizing kind of serum or, or, or solution. And they would actually 
<laughs> they would basically inject it to your dog system to with the idea that if we give the allergen more frequently that the body will get desensitized. And I had it done, it didn't really work. And if it works, it is just that the immune system eventually just gets so fatigued and so exhausted that it actually stops reacting, but it is not necessarily any healthier. It's like, you know, when they do experiments with the animals, unfortunately, they, they put two rats in a glass cone and which one stops struggling uh, first will actually, that's how they test antidepressants. They actually test them. And when they put these rats in the cones, the one that stops struggling um, uh, is, uh, the drug is less effective basically. And the, the rat that struggles longer is, is, is more effective. So if you are taking antidepressants, uh, this is another reason to do, to try your best to actually not use them because uh, the testing, how they do the testing is really horrible. I derailed a little bit, but what I wanted to say, the immune system is similar to that. It stops struggling eventually. But if I have a disease, disease of the immune system and I keep actually hammering it with allergen, more allergens, and I'm injecting them in the body, in the system, that is not a cure. That is basically just creating a fatigue of the whole body. So, you know, desensitizing injections from my perspective are not really that helpful. I have not seen them work in dogs. I have not seen them work in myself. And I think that they're counter, counterproductive. Hi, Paxi. Pax came to say hi. Um, the other thing that we can do is to put um, our dogs in little space spacesuits, right? Or in, in little bags. Paxi, <laughs> he has a bone and he's taking on the couch. Oh my goodness, you guys, if you saw him, he's so funny. Uh, so spacesuit probably would not work either. And, you know, can we prevent our dogs from having fun on a, on a meadow uh, somewhere? I think that that's not a solution either. Uh, many of the dermatologists and allergy specialists say, well, you know, let's, uh, let's eliminate the allergens. Uh, let's put our dogs into a cleaner environment. Let's use filters at home and let's eliminate all the diets that your dog is allergic to. And then eventually we'll end up with a dog not being able to go out and having nothing else to eat than hydrolyzed protein diet that is not really what dogs thrive on. What I'd like you to see allergies as is a disease of the immune system when the immune system gets overwhelmed, overburdened, and depleted. It's no different than if you were sitting in an office and someone piled up a whole bunch of work on your desk. Now, this is an extreme, but we all know how it feels to be overwhelmed. When we are overwhelmed, we can do two things. We can either overreact, which is the case of allergies, or we can go into depression and do nothing. And I see that in dogs that do not necessarily get allergic, but the dogs that let, let's say, infection or cancer cells proliferate or multiply in the body because the immune system is not efficient, okay? And we know that cancer is a disease of the immune system as well that fails to select the cancer cells because we all have cells that go astray. But at certain point in our life, it may happen, and hopefully not to us, not to you, it, and our dogs, um, it may happen that the cells will not be detected. So see allergies as the number one kind of, or the, the first option where the immune system is overreacting. And the good news is for those of you who have allergic dogs, I very rarely see them getting cancer because they have an immune system that is going a little more strong and is high strung and overreactive as opposed to the immune system that is underreactive. Weirdly enough, the breeds that are more mellow and docile have more tendency to cancer. It almost seems that if we have an overreactive dog, the dog is more likely to be allergic as well. On the overreactive, I mean on the emotional level, they're more likely to be allergic. 
I am a little more high strung. I'm definitely not mellow, Alicia, right? Like, but I'm not, I'm not bad, but I'm, you know, I'm passionate and get excited easily about things. Um, I have more of a tendency to allergies. But if someone is, you know, if you have friends or dogs that, you know, got allergies, sorry, got cancer, you may kind of look at it and see that, that, that the, the immune system was responding to in the same way that there are little more mellow, a little more subdued, a little more submissive, and, and that may predispose them to being less reactive and, and possibly the immune system not as effective. So this is just a side note here. Uh, so going back to the desk full of paper, this is how our immune system feels. It can be due to toxins missing. I have a G missing here, <laughs> so that's funny. <laughs> Food, toxins, missing nutrients, uh, and stress are the main factors. And we cannot really remove our dogs from the world that we live in. We cannot remove ourselves from the world that we live in. And when the allergies strike, basically our garbage bin or their garbage bin is full, not our garbage bin in our house, but their proverbial garbage bin in their body is full. So the immune system needs to be calmed down. And it is by, once again, big surprise, applying the healing cycle. Allergies are the symptom, just to repeat, allergies are the symptom, they're not the cause, okay? They're not the cause, they're the symptom. The cause is the overwhelmed immune system uh, that has been affected by, by all these different factors, toxins, food, depletion, deficiency, stress. Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit of a review again, uh, these are the main components from my point of view, why allergies happen. These are the main factors. I can tell you that when I was young, I was eating all the wrong foods. I was addicted to sugar. I ate sweets, wafers, European wafers. Oh my goodness. Like there's some really good yummy wafers. Like there would be these um, like little tubes, so like little pipes filled with uh, Nutella. And they would, we would kind of roll them, peel them off. And then we would eat the Nutella inside on, on its own. Oh my goodness. But it was sugary. And, and I ate so much sugar and also dairy and, and some of the other immune stimulants that probably weren't good for my immune system. And because I was predisposed by my genetic predisposition to allergies, it was, and the epigenetic factors, the chocolate and the sweets and all that stuff were playing a role. Then I triggered my allergies. I noticed though that my nose was plugged up more when I ate certain foods and plugged up less when I didn't eat certain foods. And when I was about 18 or 19, I started kind of researching uh, researching um, uh, microbiotics and nutrition. And I actually cured my allergies by, by starting to eat better. So I was really early when, when it came to that. I remember that little almost half empty shelf in the library in my hometown. And I would go and I would find that book on how to treat allergies with microbiotics. And I would, um, I would pick it and I would read it and, and, and it helped me. So that was the start with allergies. Um, but going back to your dogs, because that's the most important one. So in conventional medicine, we would use antihistamines. And I am quite certain that many of you still use antihistamines, whether it's for your dog or yourself, or worst case scenario steroids, which suppress the immune system reaction. And if we think of immune system disease and we add drugs that suppress it, it is no different than taking a sleeping pill if your house catches on fire. Because we are putting the immune system to sleep. We're putting the immune system to sleep and prevent it from reacting. And I will share this uh, image. I thought I was sharing and I wasn't. So here I am. And I'm going to go back here. So these are the factors that play a role in allergies, true causes of allergies, plus DNA. I should have put the DNA in the center here. And uh, this is the house that catches on fire. We definitely don't want to use corticosteroids in case of allergies. 
we shouldn't be using antihistamines ideally because they again suppress the immune system reactions and antibiotics well you know if there is a skin infection or something like that secondary to allergies i know that sometimes they need to be used but most of the time we don't need to use them and if some someone argues well you know but my dog is really uncomfortable and i know that some of these some some of your dogs are there is no way around it we just have to put a t-shirt on our dog and deal with uh, with the allergies the way nature would deal with them or according to the healing cycle because if we suppress them with drugs that basically put the immune system to sleep it doesn't end well usually and most often what i see dogs become incurable uh their system is so messed up um that it just there nothing nothing can help eventually we know that if we take a sleeping pill when our house catches on fire it's not going to be a happy end right and the same thing happens with corticosteroids especially and antihistamines two point and antibiotics i would say that they are the crutch and they will not solve the problem they will just add toxins to the body when the immune system is already overwhelmed and if you have allergies and you add antibiotics for example you're just making the body dealing with the allergies plus the toxicity of the antibiotics right so every time you take artificial drug the body needs to deal with the condition and also with the medication and detox it and eliminate it and i'm not necessarily saying that drugs are always contraindicated but often they are so sometimes we have to be brave you know i faced um so much opposition when it comes to coming up and presenting these ideas um it made me realize that first i had to lose the fear of being ostracized or even losing my license or or you know being seen as the crazy person because um i knew that i was on the right track not only with the experience of my allergies but i also have been using the techniques that i'm going to present to you uh in my practice and they worked so we really need to dare to be different um because if we if we just try to be like the others and and you know it's in our dna evolutionary that we try to be like the others not to be rejected if we are like the others we will often not solve the problems that we need to solve so um what is in the toolbox here um the treatment of allergies the healing cycle consists of species appropriate diet because if you see allergies as a problem that is partially caused by wrong food then we can help our dogs we need to get rid of the toxins because the toxins again overwhelm the immune system we need to finely tune digestive tract we need to talk about spine and spinal alignment because spine affects every single cell every single area of our body every single organ and then we have to talk about vaccine we have to talk about vaccinosis which is in the holistic circles term that we use for ailments from over vaccination and we also need to talk about stress because stress affects the immune system because stress increases the production of stress hormones in the body and stress hormones actually suppress the immune system function and mess it up a little bit if there is too much stress so just remember that or take a screenshot of this cycle because you will need to if you have an allergic dog you will need to go through this cycle there is no way around it um i have not seen anything else work let's go to food and i'm going to i'm going to um i don't often go to process food formulas but i do need to go back today because i want to show you how much nonsense is in every bag of kibble <laughs> i was going through this slide yesterday and i realized one thing uh 
Let me just see if I can move it. If you see at the bottom, those check marks here, um, I found this on the website of one of the kibble manufacturers. I do have a principle of not really stating names of the, these manufacturers because um, I do not comment on products of other people or companies directly, but I have taken some of these formulas and then under the formulas, was a statement, science has driven the creation of our nutrition since 1939. And then the other comment here was developed with combined expertise of 20, 220 plus vet scientists and pet nutritionists. And this was a formula that contained chicken, cornmeal, ground sorghum, chicken byproduct, ground whole grain barley, dried beef pulp, chicken flavor, dry egg product, chicken fat, la la la, brewer's yeast, um, flax meal. There are not many ingredients that actually dogs would eat, wild dogs would eat, would eat in nature or nature would, would think of as proper food for dogs. <laughs> if you have horses or if you love horses, um, if I tell you, that you should go to a grocery store, get some steaks and feed it to your horse, you will think that I'm absolutely nuts. And unfortunately, this is what we are doing to our dogs. Um, you know, there is another recipe here, corn, powdered cellulose, wheat gluten, chicken, la 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 la, you can read it here. Powdered cellulose is actually wood chips. Like, I know that my dog likes to like sticks, but I don't think that he likes having a meal of wood chips. Uh, you know, there is like brewer's, he, uh, brewer's rice. So that, that's the rice that brewers use for brewing something. I don't know what they brew from yeast, so from rice, but uh, the remnants of the rice are put in our dog food. And we know that rice is not really nutritious. Like it's basically a carrier of flavor. And, and starch, but it is not good nutrients. And go back, developed with the combined expertise of 220 vet scientists and pet nutritionists. I would love them to come to our, vet, uh, pod, uh, to our uh, Facebook Live. Um, it would be lovely to have a conversation with them. I would like to see them. You know, some time ago, about two months ago, I got lured by an ad for a really funny toothbrush that was like a little uh, mouthpiece that you kind of put in your mouth and it vibrates and it's supposed to clean your teeth. And it was, it, the, the ad said developed by, you know, by a dentist and I bought it and then I used it. It was absolutely useless. I couldn't find the company's website after I bought it. It was all just a fake product. And I realized that I was really silly. I actually got lured by this developed by a dentist and, 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 you know, a website that was making statements. And we have to be really careful about what statements are made because I don't even know whether 220 scientists and veterinarians, you know, participated in creating these formulas. And why did they say 220 plus? Like, <laughs> it, or it's already fishy, right? But if you, if you, Kind of look at how gullible sometimes we are because we want to help our dogs or want to help our teeth, whatever it is. Uh, it's 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 kind of wild. So let's not have, I would say, too much discussion about whether wholesome food is better. But I also don't want you to feel guilty if you're feeding kibble or if you were told that your dog has to be on hydrolyzed protein or other hypoallergenic diets. But the problem is that if you feed your dog kibble, it sits on the shelf for months sometimes before it gets to your dog's bowl. It is rancid. It is full of ingredients that are not species appropriate. And they will create conditions, this, this, this kibble will create conditions um, that are damaging or overstimulating or affecting the immune system. 80% of the immune system is in the gut and it would be a 
big surprise if it didn't affect if food like that didn't affect the immune system and i know it does but but you know i'd like you to understand it in in, in simple ways and terms if you are if you have an allergic dog and if he came to my practice and he said peter i don't think that i can feed i don't think i can feed um non-processed food I will say, I'm sorry. It's like saying that you don't want to fix the roof if it's leaking and you're complaining about damaged floors. Like I can't really help you. It's like, Peter, I don't want to have, um, you know, it's like saying, Peter, I don't want to have uh, my dog's teeth infected. And I say, well, we have to do dental cleaning and then we have to look after your dogs by giving him bones. And you say, I don't want to do that. I say, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this, is not, this is not something that I can help you with. So if you have an allergic dog and you're feeding kibble, I will say, think about it. It's not your fault that you're feeding kibble. I don't blame you. You've been told that that's the best thing for your dog, but your dog's allergies will not be addressed. And that's a big problem, right? Like you have to make a decision what you're going to do here. I will share my screen again, because I realize that sometimes I think I'm sharing and then I'm not sharing. This is, um, this is the difference between kibble and whole, whole, wholesome diet. And this is uh, how you can make these recipes. We created this recipe maker some time ago because uh, many dog lovers were asking me for recipes for raw food or cooked food. And I said, I'm no, I know Julia Childs, I don't wanna make recipes. I'm gonna give you a tool to make recipes yourself. And you can even share them with your community or with our community. So recipe maker can be found and I will show you the website and I will show you how it works. I will pay a little more attention to um, showing you some examples here. So, uh, Safari here. A recipe maker can be found by typing recipe maker, recipe maker dot peter device dot com. And um, you can just basically click start and then it'll take you through a whole sequence by selecting, for example, your meat. So if you wanna feed beef, then you select beef. Then you choose some vegetables that you want to mix in your dog's food. And I usually use food processor. And it also gives you an idea of which vegetables are good. And there's some information about the veggies. Well, this is really fun. And then today I'm not gonna feed any uh, organs. Uh, you know, organs are recommended, but they're not really absolutely essential, especially if you give um, essential supplements. Um, and so I'm just gonna say, I don't want organs right now and I don't want any bones right now. So I'm just gonna skip um, bones. And uh, then you can decide Pax is a male, so I'll make it for Pax. Um, he weighs about 55 pounds. And then uh, he's more than six months and he's healthy weight. You can actually assess your dog based on the weight here. Can you see? This is kind of fun, isn't it? And then, um, oh, you must eat, enter your dog's name. I didn't do that. Where? Oh, here, Paxi Maxi. <laughs> um, and I go next. And I can enter a name here, Paxis recipe. And um, you can tell us more about your dog if you want. We'd like to hear about your dog. And I'm gonna put um, an email and I'm just gonna do contact at peterdubias.com because, why is there a period, Alicia? That's a weird one. Uh, we may need to, um, Fix that. <laughs> uh, PeterDubias.com. So this is our customer service email address. Oh. oh, I see my name. I see that's what it is. 
contact at peterdubais.com. Uh, so then there is also another step. Uh, this product program will, uh, will help you select essentials. Um, after that, uh, I also want to create this recipe for one day or I, I say, I'm gonna make seven day supply of this recipe. So it will tell you exactly how much to buy. <laughs> you need about uh, 101 ounces of food or 2.8 kilos. And then you need asparagus and cabbage and bok choy. I actually didn't recommend cabbage because it, um, it is goitrogenic. It may cause, um, it may cause hypothyroidism if you feed too much of it. So then I'm gonna click here and what happens? Oh, and then it gives you that we can create a supplement plan. So that's even more fun that you can actually go, I'm just gonna choose any dog here. You can go and choose supplements for the dog, for the diet. But anyway, um, I'll talk supplements later. I just wanted to show you how this uh, recipe maker works and um, I wanted to show you a little bit more detail because I usually just fly through it and then um, you don't see the practical implication or application of that. So we, talk, we talked about detox, that that's the next step. So first one is diet, the second one is um, detox. I have formulated liver tune which is a liver cleanse and detox. And I formulated it because I was not really happy with the products that were on the market. And sometimes when I talk about problems, I like to offer solutions. So I'm not embarrassed to actually sell products and offer them because I give them to my dog as well. I think that I'm sharing the wrong slideshow again here. Just a second, Alicia. It's here. All right. So liver tune ingredients are fermented and fermentation increases the anti-inflammatory, antioxidant and anti-cancer properties. It also affects the bioavailability of these ingredients. I put barley grass, milk thistle, dandelion root, artichoke, cilantro, ashwagandha, broccoli sprouts and turmeric. I can't really go through all the ingredients here, uh, milk thistle is great for liver cleansing. Uh, we know that ashwagandha is ad adaptogen. It increases the, uh, decreases um, stress response and increases stress tolerance in dogs. Turmeric is anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer and so on and so on. So you can go to livertune.com and look up the ingredients and also feedback from people that we got. Um, if you feed natural food. So we are going through the allergy protocol. If you feed natural food cooked or raw, and if you detox your dog, then you have to give the essentials. And I talk about it almost every Facebook live that our food is depleted. And there is no way we can make our dog's diet complete. If we do not provide the essential minerals, vitamins, omega oils, and probiotics. I've tried before without. My dog Sky was without supplements for eight years and Pax has been on the supplement since he was a puppy. Sky was fairly healthy, he lived 16 years, but the difference in how they're built and how they do and how well they fare with, with, with life and, and health is a totally different ball game. I had to maintain Sky's health and it was always quite a bit of work, even though he was healthier than average. With Pax Touchwood, he's amazing. I also take the essentials myself because I've seen the difference that they make on dogs. It went as far that we are going to be launching our human line because many dog lovers have been taking, including my family and myself and my friends and my team have been taking these supple, dog supplements themselves. And I finally said, you know, we have to make a human, human formulas because this is kind of crazy. And even though nutrients are generally accepted by the body as nutrients, whether you're a dog or a person, whether they're a dog and you're a person, uh, but there's certain differences in the formulas, especially when it comes to vitamins and so on. So going back, minerals, um, vitamins, probiotics, and omega oils are the four essential nutrients, the fabulous four. 
I will give you a little insight into what we've created um, by sharing another page. And as I said, most of the time I don't go through this with the detail, but I need to because I want you to understand what, um, what you need to be selecting if your dog is allergic or something similar, right? So again, the four different groups, we call them fabulous four. You can see that they're not badly rated. <laughs> we post all the reviews and you can read them. Um, Dr. Tobias, sorry to interrupt. Um, I see the slideshow and it says Fab Four, but I'm not seeing the website yet. Oh my goodness. Sharing today is a little off for me. So again, these are the essentials, the four groups. Here are the reviews if you want to know what other people say. And um, here are the products. Minerals, fermented vitamins, and there is a big difference between synthetic non-fermented vitamins and fermented vitamins because fermented vitamins are bound by the fermented media as a protein as opposed to giving chemicals. Uh, you know that if you give, um, if you take vitamins that are synthetic, sometimes we get sick from the stomach. These supplements do not make your dog sick because they are fermented. And fermentation increases the bioavailability, antioxidant capacity, anti-inflammatory capacity and anti-cancer capacity. And this is all scientifically proven. That's why most of our products are fermented. And if you're wondering why they're a little more expensive, well, the fermentation is actually quite the process and it is more costly, but I know that it is more effective. And again, um, you know, the biggest problem that we have with our reviews is that we don't have enough negative reviews. So sometimes people go like, how can you have 4.9 stars out of five? I don't know. You tell me. Well, I actually do know. We put our heart and soul in the products and uh, I love doing uh, formulating formulas and so on. So you can go to these, um, to these fabulous four. You can just go to on our website and uh, look for essentials. All these will be listed there and read through them, read about them, why they are important. Minerals cannot be made by the body. And if you have an immune system that is ill, it may be because manganese is missing or zinc or chromium. That is very possible. You have to have vitamins in the body and the food is depleted because of depletion of soils. Again, you cannot correct a disease without giving the body what it needs. We cannot build a car without parts. We cannot build a bike without cars. We also know that tomatoes don't grow in the garden without proper nutrients. They wither away. For whatever reason, we completely forget in medicine that the body needs nutrients. How often do you have a vet asking, so what minerals are you giving to your dog? What vitamins are you giving to your dog? Are you giving omegas? Maybe for allergies, that is more common recommendation, but quite often it is not. Are we giving probiotics because our dog micro, dog's microflora is affected by the food and the environment that they live in? Even giving chlorinated water can have huge impact on your dog's allergies if it's not filtered because it will destroy the bacteria, the positive, the, 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 the probiotic bacteria in the, the gut. So remember that even chlorinated water is important to address if your dog is allergic. Now there is one, beside probiotics, there is one other uh, food that you can give or tincture that you can give for an allergic dog and it's stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is, um, stingy <laughs> to the skin, but when it's given in a tincture form, it is beneficial for allergies. It is, it is known, it has been scientifically confirmed to address allergies. Do we have a slide for that as well? We do have a slide and I have a dose here as well. Thank you, so thank you, Alicia. Welcome. There's a lot of sharing going back and forth. So it's a little, challenging for me to forget to, to remember to switch the slide. So if you have a sting nettle tincture, if you have an allergic dog, you want to administer about one eight to one quarter of a teaspoon per 10 to 20 pounds of a dog. The higher, uh, the smaller the dog, the higher relative dose. So if you have a small little chihuahua, give the one quarter teaspoon. And if you have a larger dog, then you can go more, let's say if you have a hundred 
pound dog, then you would give um, one eight times 10. That would be 10, one eight, that's one teaspoon and a bit. <laughs> 1.2 teaspoons, I think, if I calculate right. Anyway, so this is what you can change. Diet, nutrients, detox, gut health, and another part is spine. Now, I'm going to show a few slides. These are not dogs that are allergic. These are dogs that have been held by addressing spinal injuries. And I will explain why that is so. I started noticing early on that dogs have hotspots in certain areas of the body. And the hotspots correspond with spinal segments that are somehow twitchy and sensitive and the muscles are tight and inflamed and there is heat. So first what I do when I examine a dog, I would actually run my hand along the spine and I go, okay, this is a sensitive spot. Then I go along the ribs or with the energy lines and I go, oh, the hotspot is right here. There's a sensitive spot in the spine. Let's treat the spine and see what happens with the hotspots. And I started to see these hotspots actually disappearing. This can go as far as dogs being injured by exercise, by um, some sort of fall or excessive intense activity. And going back to these pictures, this dog had a sore spot right here up here, you can see the energy line here. And anything beyond that segment sometimes can be affected. You know, it's almost like see the, see the spine as a pipe and if the pipe is um, affected by the muscle tightness and inflammation, um, it gets pinched. And the spine anywhere past that point is affected and the skin past that point is affected. I see dogs that would have um, normal skin in the front no allergies, in quotes, and no skin problems, and really poor skin from a certain segment in the spine. As soon as that segment is addressed by a chiropractor, physiotherapy, acupuncture, or some sort of muscle release technique, the whole problem disappears. Feet. So many dogs lick their feet and they're diagnosed as allergic. Unfortunately, most of them are not allergic at all. They have neck injuries from collars when they pull. Sometimes when we use these um, retractable leashes, um, people use the brake, dog is running, they want to stop the dog, dog is running, <laughs> big jaw to the neck. If it happens repeatedly, there will be nerve injury, neck injury, the dog will start, your dog will start licking the paws because there will be abnormal pin and needle sensation or some sort of numbing. If you had sore neck, you know that sometimes it does reflect in our hands. If you have sore lumbar area, it reflects in our hind, in our, not hind, our hind legs, in our legs, in our dog's hind legs. Um, you may ask, well, how about this dog that, that was rubbing his eyes? Well, this dog that was rubbing his eyes was playing tug of war really intensely. And a dog to dog tug of war is different than human to dog tug of war. We are too strong and dogs don't really have that kind of give, right? And they will start twisting and turning until they subluxate the, or, or misalign the cervical spine. And that will actually reflect in the nerve supply in the head, blood supply in the head. And sometimes dogs may actually just, just present this by itching the eyes or dogs that are really intense chewers on balls or they like to chew on toys and, 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 and balls, they will have tightness in the jaw muscle and that will decrease the energy and blood flow to the whole area and affect the eyes. And sometimes dogs will scratch their jaw really intensely and people will think my dog is allergy, allergic or has, has fleas. And that is not the case. They just have tightness in the muscles in that area. Dogs can give themselves a massage. They give themselves a massage by chewing and scratching, right? So there is another case here. Uh, and I wanted to present it because this is not, this is not a spinal issue. 
This is most likely not actually in this case, it was not um, allergic issue. This dog had Cushing's disease, adrenal gland disease, where the adrenal glands overproduce uh, stress hormones and corticosteroids. And this is what happens when there are too much corticosteroids in the body. There are some other conditions that your dog has to be checked for. Mange, Cushing's disease, hypothyroidism, heavy metals, lack of minerals, digestive function, and all that can affect our dog's immune system and our dog's body. And it can present as if your dog had allergies or dogs with, let's say, Cushing's disease will present with infections because the immune system is not functioning properly and the bacteria will be, will be more likely, um, um, you know, proliferating or multiplying on the skin and causing problems. So I'm going to give you a little summary here. If your dog has hotspots in certain areas, take a screenshot here and see whether there is some sort of relationship of the licking or bald spots or skin infections in certain area. This particular spot that I'm pointing to right now is also a spot that has a relationship obviously with this skin segment here, but also the liver. It's kind of like a central thoracic spine. And sometimes when the liver is out of balance or diseased, it sends signals to the spine, the segment will tighten up and the skin will also be affected. So sometimes the liver is the problem and then it causes a spasm and it affects the skin. Or if you have, um, if you have a neck issue, as I said, it would be the paw. Liver cleanse is an important part of dealing with allergies because it affects the whole body, the whole immune system. But if your dog has is scratching right in the central abdominal region or has twitchy skin up here, that may be because the liver is acting up. All the organs have actually relationship to the spine. And I don't, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to talk about every single organ, but this is a good example. Exercise that is too intense. Collar injuries, I see so many dogs on chains and also electric collars that can affect um, the, the energy and blood flow. Tug of war, neck twists. These are the, the, the problems or the, the causes of the conditions that look like allergies but are not true allergies. But we also know that some dogs have true allergies and we talked about how to address them, right? Like this is the healing cycle. Before we finish, uh, I would like to talk to you about spinal work. These are the modes of therapy that I would use or recommend. If you live in a certain area, you may not have a chiro, but you may have a massage therapist for dogs or Reiki practitioner or osteopath or, um, you know, T-touch practitioner, all those techniques may work. If you don't have any of those, make sure that you don't you stop the injurious activity. If your dog is too intense with the ball, stop it for some time and see what happens. Do massage yourself at home. It's better than nothing. I massage packs quite often, actually. Every day I would lie down with him and I would massage him, his feet and his armpits and all that. Sometimes dogs can be itchy when they shed in spring. So don't be surprised. And, and Pax actually, when we came to Maui, he had a really thick coat and he was scratching because the body was actually throwing off the hair. But there, was no, there were no skin lesions, he was healthy. And when he stopped the shedding, the scratching stopped. So that's another possible cause, okay? Minimize vaccination. I know that we are in the, we live in times when Vaccines are talked about a lot. I'm not necessarily saying that vaccines should or should not be given. I'm not gonna get into that. Everyone has the freedom of choosing. But when it comes to our dogs, we have over-vaccinated our dogs. And I've seen that in practice when they are given seven plus antigens or different diseases at the same time, they're called the multivalent vaccines. And when that happens, the immune system gets overwhelmed. 
And when that happens, the body starts freaking out because, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't, it's not a natural situation. In nature, most of the time you would see one antigen, one disease entering the body at, 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 at once. It wouldn't be seven antigens entering the body. And that's why we do see immune disease after vaccination quite often. It can lead as far when the body starts attacking its own cells, uh, like red blood cells or platel platelets. And that leads to life-threatening condition, hemolytic anemia um, or thrombocytopenia, which is lack of platelets. So if your dog has been diagnosed with autoimmune disease, it may be because it was um, the immune system has been overwhelmed by vaccines, but also by toxins or inappropriate diet. There is a blog that, uh, that uh, talks about um, all this. I'll show you. It is right here. So if you go to our, my website, all you need to do is to search for vaccination in the search window and it'll, it'll bring up this blog. Uh, See, so safer vaccination protocol for adult dogs and puppies. Actually, Alicia, we have two blogs here, so maybe we can actually consolidate it. And um, it kind of gives you an overview what to do about vaccines and how to reduce immunity. I even give examples of the titer testing that I did for PAX. Um, he had positive parvo and distemper titer without any vaccines and he still has. So it tells you that when the maternal antibodies are in the body and you socialize your dog with other dogs, while they're protected, you can actually generate normal acquired antibodies by socializing dogs when they're protected with maternal antibodies. This is what nature intended. Unfortunately, this is not what we've been taught and this is not what you've been told. Also, vaccines don't need to be given as often as one or every three years or every one year. The antibodies in many instances last for lifetime. And this is something that you'll also find in the blog. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't vaccinate at all. What I'm saying is that we need to vaccinate only as little as necessary to keep our dogs protected. And this is a difference. Unfortunately, when we minimize vaccines, vaccine companies do not make as much money and they are not happy about it. So they, for years, they try to convince veterinary veterinarians and the veterinary community that vaccines are, need to be given every year. And they would come to the clinics and hospitals and, and buy us pizza and tell us how important it is to vaccinate against some diseases like kennel cough, which is not necessary because kennel cough, for example, is a self-limiting disease. And I've seen kennel cough being caused by vaccine more frequently than dogs were getting it naturally. I would give vaccine and then the next day the dog would come, come back with kennel cough a few days later because it was a live vaccine. So there's much that could be discussed about vaccines. The main point that you need to remember is that vaccines need to be minimized. Going back to our slideshow, I think that we're almost at the end. Um, I wanted to share a picture of um, Pax <laughs> and Lana, his girlfriend. And Pax and Lana uh, have, we, we basically um, go that route of minimal vaccination for them. I'll show you the picture here. Sorry, I'm slow. The other day I was working, preparing this presentation and uh, Alicia, can you see it? I can see the website and not the uh, keynote just yet. I'm sorry. Um, the is. other day I was preparing this presentation and uh, Paxlin and Lana were playing. Lana comes for a visit quite often. And I took this picture. I really love it because it tells me why we're do doing all that. We're doing it because we love to see our dogs happy. You guys, I'm doing exactly as I tell you to do. Like I, I do everything that I'm telling you to do because that's the only way to be. 
if we catch ourselves to recommend something that we would not do with our dogs, and I am quite certain that it still happens in veterinary medicine, that's a problem. So what I'm recommending is exactly what I do for Pax and what Lana, um, Lana is given as well. One more thing, when it comes to any new knowledge, and I know that sometimes you kind of go, is this really true? Like, is it possible that dogs could have hot spots just from spinal injuries? Or is it possible that I shouldn't be given antihistamines and that, and that I shouldn't be given the hydrolyzed food? Well, new knowledge is always hard to accept. And as when I was at the conference uh, a few years back, dermatology conference, I could see that it was very difficult for people to, if I started talking at the lunch or dinner to my colleagues, they just didn't really understand it. It is sometimes super hard to see something very, very simple and self-evident. You know, people thought that the earth was flat. There's still some people who think that the earth is flat. <laughs> There's still some veterinarians who think that steroids are perfect for dogs with allergies and they're absolutely justified. I know that that is not true. As much as you know, at least most of you, that the earth is not flat. It wouldn't make sense, really. <laughs> New knowledge is often ridiculed when the first astrologist, I think it was Galileo Galilei, who, who came with the idea that, that the earth wasn't flat. You know, he was ostracized. He was ridiculed, ridiculed. And then a few people thought, well, you know, maybe that's true. And they accepted the knowledge. And then eventually it became common sense. And now it's kind of taken for, for granted. And I think that this is what's happening in medicine. You have to be patient with whomever disagrees with you about holistic care, natural care, because they see the world and medicine through the flat earth glasses. They, they think that they kind, of, they kind of practice flat earth medicine. Some time ago, I talked to a colleague. He said something that I wasn't totally comfortable with. He says, you know, if there wasn't as holistic vets, it would be a serious problem. I do not think that we are any different. I think that we are maybe more curious and a little more gutsy, but I do not think that Conventional veterinarians who do not believe in holistic medicine or natural medicine and techniques and, and approaches, I do not think that they don't care. I think they care. Most of them care as much about your dog as the holistic vets. And therefore, I do feel uncomfortable when people say sometimes, you know, holistic vets are better than the conventional vets. They're not better. They're just more curious and gutsy and maybe a little less afraid to be looked down upon by the establishment and being ostracized. And I'm really happy that I, I had the guts and I, that I am curious and nosy and I look around and see how could I solve the problems differently because when I see techniques not working and the conventional approach is not working, I just, I just look and look and look. And I haven't solved everything, of course, but what I have solved, I'm sharing with you. And I hope that we'll be able to see at the webinar Facebook live in two weeks because we'll be doing question and answers and law case uh, um, raw, <laughs> raw cases no no live cases I've been talking for too long <laughs> raw cases anyway Alicia do you have any questions <laughs> so many questions but we'll try to keep it short um, knowing that there's a part two coming uh, next time we do Facebook live um, so thank you for all of the amazing info a um, couple of questions from the community. You mentioned nettle before, I think in the tincture format, and Carol asks, what about steamed or dried nettle? Is that still effective? Um, you know, I have had experience um, tincture. Um, I actually looked around for some sort of um, information about whether nettle can be fed in the original form. And there are some slightly conflicting information online. 
some people say that it can be stomach irritant and that we shouldn't be giving it as a, you know, in the, in the steam form or a raw form. I still question it. Like, you know, I, I think that you can try, but I cannot really tell you whether it would be okay. I think I know that the tincture is okay. I don't know whether um, raw or steamed nettle is okay. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Svetlana. She asks, can a skin allergy appear after a four hour dog operation due to perhaps a lot of medication and the anesthesia? Is that something that you've had experience with that a dog presents with allergic like skin condition just as a result of the medication that they've been on? Um, it's definitely possible that a certain skin condition comes up after procedure. There are a few things, few reasons. One of them is the stress and the toxin buildup in the body. Maybe there was medication prescribed. Maybe the, the system was just really already stressed and overwhelmed. And it just kind of the last tipping point. The same thing, you know, some people may not be allergic for 20 years and suddenly the bucket gets full, right? And, and we start having reactions. Um, the other possibility is, and, and this is something that I always warn people about and, and talk to their vets and technicians. Dogs are stretched on the table quite intensely sometimes to line them up in uh, the surgical table. And, and there can be spinal misalignment. Uh, I would recommend doing detox, making sure that the nutrition is okay, and also um, aligning the spine. Uh, have your dog's spine checked. Thank you. And that leads right into the next question. Um, Fatima asks, do you recommend chiropractic care from an early age? And if so, how many times a year ideally? I do recommend chiropractic, Kate, uh, chiropractic, um, um, chiropractic, I'm, I'm getting tired here. I, I'm so excited about talking about allergies. I do recommend chiropractic care um, from early age. Um, I take packs to a chiropractor once every two to three months, but I have also learned, I'm not a certified chiropractor but my chiropractor taught me some adjustment techniques. So I actually have been using them on packs and I do them as needed, right? So if your dog falls or tumbles, or if there is intense exercise and you see that suddenly they start scratching in a certain area and they're repeatedly scratching a certain area, it may be a sign that, that the spine is slightly misaligned. Um, and as your dog gets middle aged to older, I would recommend uh, doing adjustments um, every month and checking the spine mm -hmm. and Great. doing massage. And if you have a dog 10 plus, just do massage. I, you know, I used to have a massage therapist coming, coming uh, at home, uh, coming home for Sky's massage. I also took Sky to underwater treadmill um, to exercise his core muscles and keeping him strong. Pax, he likes to fish in the little ponds here in Maui. And so he does aquafit from early age. So, you know, this morning, actually, I started to swim when he fishes uh, for half an hour. I swim and he fishes and it's a great combo. I know that he's well entertained and exercise and I can exercise too and strengthen my muscles. So if you have a dog that likes to wade in a pond or river or a lake, Great exercise. Throwing the ball for extended period of time, maybe not as good. Mm -hmm. No wolves or coyotes or wild canines would be actually doing that for half an hour, 45 minutes. They would try to catch maybe the salmon or fish, but that would not be happening in that intensity that we practice with our dogs, right? Sometimes when we throw toys. I'm not a big ball thrower and toy thrower. I, I throw it once or twice for bags, but I never condition him to do that. And if you have a dog that is obsessed with, with um, uh, ball or toys, um, I would recommend you trying to redirect the attention to something a little more healthy, like tracking, jogging, looking for the toys, asking them to at least wait until it lands and then run for them because the sudden jarring and breaking is not really good for them if it happens on an ongoing basis. 
we know that athletes like performance athletes are get injured and our dogs get injured too from those. So you have to be mindful. I'm not saying do not have fun with your dog. I'm saying be mindful, be aware and know how to address these injuries that inevitably happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, two last short ones, if we can, um, this comes up a lot. It is a question about Benadryl. Um, we hear from people that give their dog Benadryl, which is um, mainly for humans. It's an over-the-counter antihistamine. What is your take on people giving that to their dog? Ah, well, I tell you how I, how I approach it in my life and um, how I would approach it with PAX. If there was some sort of severe allergic reaction let's say to bee sting or you know, something else that your dog is allergic to. And I would see that my dog has uh, issues of breathing or um, mouth swelling. I would first give APIS 1M, which is a homeopathic remedy, A-P-I-S 1M, homeopathic remedy. And I would give it repeatedly every hour for the day uh, or maybe I'm maybe not every hour, but four to six times just to basically neutralize that effect. If the swelling doesn't go down within 15 to 30 minutes or 60 minutes, and you can see that your dog is not doing well, then giving antihistamine is actually a very sensible thing to do. Zero point, if I remember well, 0 0.1 milligrams per pound of body weight, 0 0.2 milligrams per pound kilogram. <laughs> uh, so that's one. Then give omega oils as an anti-inflammatory and give turmeric as another anti-inflammatory. And maybe the um, uh, sting nettle tincture as well. So those would be apis, omega, turmeric dose, and um, sting nettle. If you see that your dog is in critical situation, antihistamine is justified. Mm -hmm. However, giving our dogs antihistamines just because they scratch is not ideal. We're suppressing the immune system on an ongoing basis. We're basically giving a gentle sleeping pill at the time the body is on fire or is agitated, activated. Uh, we are going against the body's signaling system and it is ultimately not addressing the problem. I wish we had some sort of um, allergic dog support group. I almost feel like uh, maybe we can try it for a few sessions just to see how it goes. I'm not promising anything yet, but I'll talk to Alicia. She always tells me that I'm too busy, but maybe I can, we can do something to see how we can help more allergic dogs because drugs are definitely not the answer. And now we have a few new pieces of information Unfortunately, if your dog has been giving drugs for a long time, it may lead to the body's inability to heal. It's almost like if you, you know, if you, if you drive in your car and you have a handbrake on and, and step on the brake pedal and at the same time on the gas pedal, like something is gonna happen sooner or later, right? The car is gonna break down. And I think that when we give drugs, for allergies and do not address the primary causes, which I just mentioned, we basically block the body's ability to heal. We cause more damage. And I'm just trying to put it in simpler terms so I don't discourage you and I don't, I don't really make you feel bad. But if your dog has been on drugs for a long time, sometimes it may not be possible to help. And then the drugs are the only solution, the last resort. But I know that most often they're used way too early without a good understanding of what really is going on. And if you talk to your veterinarian who may not be aware of what I, about what I just mentioned here. He will not know what he or she doesn't know and they will not be willing to address 
your dog's allergies differently than with drugs. They will not be willing because they will not know that it can work, but they're not any worse than anyone else. So I just want to emphasize that your vets are all, or most of them with a few exceptions are very caring people. And those who don't seem to care are probably just burned out by trying to help with methods and techniques that they've been taught, but don't work. And that is a really hard spot to be. Eventually, we get just burned out. Anyway, on a good note, you have whole toolbox of information and knowledge. Just be open to what you don't know. And if you have questions, email us if we haven't answered them. And Thank you. Is there any other question, Alicia? Do you have one more? Or? I just wanted to let you know that so far, Laurie and Sean and Erin, I see your comments and they're all in for the support group. So we'll keep you posted. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to remind the community that if you haven't yet signed up for our newsletter, um, please do so, especially if this topic is close to your heart. Um, we have some really important information that um, speaks about this topic of allergies or perceived allergies coming out this weekend. So if you want it in the written format, now's your chance, sign up and then you can share it with your family and friends. Um, I know that this is a popular topic that we hear about a lot on a regular basis from dog lovers that are struggling. So we want to make sure everyone has access to the information. Thank you, Alicia, for reminding everyone and thanks for being here. Uh, we're so happy to have you in our community. And uh, those of you who um, trust our products and purchase them also thank you because you're making all this possible. We have now 11 customer service team members who are answering questions of anyone, even if they're not our customers. And that makes me really happy. And I know that Alicia is, um, is really happy about that too. Um, thank you, Alicia, for, for heading the whole customer service team and, and making a big difference. And also Christina behind the scenes. Even though we don't see you, Christina, we, we really appreciate you. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.